Good evening. Can you believe that we're coming to the end of another series of lessons? Believe it or not, this is the last lesson for the month of September, and really the last lesson of the eight lessons that we have considered uh, from the life of David. Our theme, of course, for last month and this month uh, we're building and rebuilding our personal lives. Lessons from the life of David. Our thought for the month of September was kingdom citizens know that every setback is an opportunity for us to rebuild, renew, and strengthen our covenant relationship with God. He will provide grace and mercy to empower us to do greater things in accordance with his purpose for our lives. And our words for this month, proper position, awakening, repentant, being real. Now we're on lesson number 39, God empowers rebuilt lives. Questions to consider for this final lesson from the series on David. What are some things that you do to strengthen yourself spiritually? What is your understanding of God's grace and mercy? Have you sincerely asked God to build and rebuild your personal life? Our closing text is from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 7, verses 18 through 23. And the heart of the lesson is this. Kingdom citizens know that God uses change to bring about transition. God uses change to bring about transition. But what are we talking about? We're talking about change being movement and transition being being transposed into something better than we were before. Change is changing a, a life that's, that's down, that's, that's, that's in ill repair, transitioning into a rebuilt life. Introduction, as we conclude this study from the life of David, it is appropriate to reflect how his life shows the way God works to build and rebuild our own personal lives. You remember when we began this series? David called by God when he was just yet a shepherd boy. How he confronted and had to face the giant named Goliath. And how we must face the giants in our lives. How he was tortured and tormented. I say I use the word tormented by Saul. You, you know what happened there. Insecure people, jealous people, sometimes play a role in trying to stop what God has for us, but they can't. How we went on from there and David became king and united the, the tribes. And guess what? How he fell from grace by being out of position and how God restored him through the prophet who said that you are the man. How he developed a repentant spirit. And what we learn from all of this is that God will not leave us, nor will he forsake us. Even when we do wrong things, as long as we go back, with the right attitude and with the proper spirit, humbly asking for his forgiveness. And then you know David goes on and becomes the great king of Israel and gets an honor and a award from God, basically, that I wish all of us could get. David is known as what a man after God's own heart. That's better than the Pulitzer Prize. That's better than the Oscar. 
that's been any kind of designation as being the greatest this and the greatest that, he got the designation from God and shall always be remembered as a man after God's own heart. He didn't do much to deserve it because mercy had to step in here and God showed him mercy. But he humbled himself and God was pleased with how David's life that had been broken down and beaten down, David found the right connection to re reconnect and to rebuild and recognize God as a God who what empowers and restores rebuilt lives. David slayed Goliath. David wrote many of the Psalms. He was a mighty warrior in battle and became king. He didn't walk into these roads with difficult, with, without difficulty. God prepared him in many ways for each of these callings on his life, just as he works with us for the many callings that we have on our lives. God spent years preparing David for his eventual role as what? As king. He taught him to fight for justice, to walk in humility. And trust him in all circumstances. David didn't get all of this at one time. It had to develop as his relationship with God developed. And the same thing happens with us. It develops and grows as we develop and grow in our relationship with him. I'm sure that there were times when David wondered, as we often do today, if he would ever see the promise of God, you're going to be king come to pass. One thing we get from this, and I want you to carry this tonight in this last lesson, our God empowers rebuilt lives. And so in our lesson, our closing lesson, which actually comes uh, at a time during the course of David's life, not at the end, as most of these series sometimes do, um, we find that uh, David uh, having a, a, a conversation with God, having, having, having a, a talk with God in a very humble way. In this lesson, God establishes a covenant relationship with David, promising success and letting him know that his promise was not just to David, but to David's ascendance. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. How would David respond? Well, let's take a look at uh, this lesson, at one of the prayers that David has, as I say, in his relationship with God. Life point number eight, the final life point. God can lift us up through every life situation. So we go to point number one. Kingdom citizens must understand that a primary goal for their lives is to be strengthened spiritually. Are you as spiritually strengthened today as you were last year this time? Well, the answer really should be no. You should be better today than you were last year this time because every year, every opportunity, every month, maybe even every day for some people, the relationship with God gets stronger and stronger. We're strengthened and strengthened, and our relationship, our spiritual growth and development gets stronger. And we find God working more and more inside of our lives. Just like us, David's faith was tested. Your faith is going to be tested. Mine is tested all the time in multiple ways. Sometimes he had to trust God through a difficulty or a trial. You have to do the same thing too. And this is something that we all can relate to. We have faith that God will help us endure hardship and come out on the other side stronger than we were when we went in. A built life is good. A rebuilt life is even better. Here we find King David responding to the covenant promise that God has given to him in verses 8 through 16 of this chapter. Is your relationship with God a growing relationship? Is used to sing a song one time, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Can you really say that and mean it? I don't know. 
That's a question that you must ask yourself. And answer yourself in the sweetness and quietness of your solitude with God. Not only did God promise to make David's name great and to establish the people of Israel and to give them rest from all of their enemies, amazingly, God also promised to give David a dynasty to establish the throne of his descendants. Not for a hundred or five hundred or even a thousand years, but for all time. What a promise this was. David's relationship with God was, this is the word I want you to write down tonight, to personal, strong, personal relationship. His humility is apparent in this prayer. Listen, listen to what this prayer says. The word says, then David, then King David, you know, you understand what I'm talking about, he's king now, you know, he ain't just David, he's King David. Went in and sat before the Lord. And he says, who am I? Woo, what a question. Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this wasn't enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. Wow. These are words of genuine gratitude and humility, inspired by the unexpected grace of God. Have you ever felt this way? Let me ask you a question. When God blesses you and you live a life that is pleasing to him, do you understand that the blessings that God has given to you is not only to you, but also goes to your succeeding generations? Don't you know that when you live a godly life, your children are watching you? And they see you living a godly life. It's something for them to imitate. They may not emulate it immediately. But at some point during the course of their own lives, they will remember. That's why some of us sometimes start talking and singing about mama's prayers and daddy's prayer. Because we remember mama praying. And we remember daddy praying. And even if we don't pray yet ourselves, we understand that somewhere within the fabric of our existence, from one generation to another, guess what? Prayer was a part of it all. And that God blessed our grandparents, our mamas, and our daddies and those prayers are going down to us. And guess what? Those prayers and that prayer lifestyle must also go to the generation that follows us. Don't you know if you saw your mama or your grandmama reading the Bible? Saw your daddy and mama reading the Bible? You should have been there with them reading the Bible sometimes. Studying the Bible together. I'm so happy to be one of my small group classes, my daughter. Uh, is with us, one of my daughters anyway, is with us every Monday night in our small group. And I know if she has children, the principles and things that we talk about in our small group, and all of y'all should go and be a part of a small group, I'm just throwing that in as a, as, a, as, a, as a promotional, that thing will go down and visit the generations that are yet to come. So I'm asking you to please think about that. David says, who am I? Wait a minute, I'm just a little boy from across the track. I'm just a little boy who, who, who lived in the, in the one room, two room, three room, four, four room house. I'm the person whose mamas and daddies didn't have a whole lot of material things. Who am I, Lord? I was just in the field taking care of the sheep. Who am I, Lord? You looked down upon me wherever I was, and you were knowing in me. And God is doing the same thing right now. He's anointing you and has anointed you to a greater purpose that goes way beyond your current circumstances and your current situation. I don't care how good it's going now. God's got gooder things for you. Ha, huh. I know good in a way, but I thought I'd throw that out. I don't care how bad things are, God's got better things for you. So you gotta live it. You gotta think it. You gotta believe it. Because it's true, and David has said, all of this things that come down on me, man, I can't understand. Who am I? Lord, that you bless me. 
like you bless me. And I have, I have to, I have to do that sometimes. I might as well tell you. I have to do it sometimes when a great I understand. That's why the lady, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul got to cry out, hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Lord, for blessing me. You can feel this coming out and coming through and being sent up by David in his conversation with God as he prays humbly, thanking God for being the God that he is. So number one says the primary goal for our lives is to be strengthened spiritually. Number two, kingdom citizens must also learn that their faith is strengthened by trusting God in what? Every situation. Through it all, David learned to rely on God and to love his word. He learned obedience and submission. Even when his life was in danger, he developed close, enduring friendships and alliances. David's past wasn't perfect, and guess what? Joe's ain't either. He had his fair share of ups and downs. So do you. So do me. He wrestled with sinful behavior. Oh, yes, so do I. So do you. God used his life experiences to deepen their relationship and prepare him for all he had planned for his life. Who am I? Who am I, Lord? God. He was not born into a family of power and prestige. He wasn't a Kennedy or a Rockefeller or a Trump or some of these big names that go around all the time. People, you know, he wasn't one of those kind of things. He wasn't the Kennedy. You know, he, he wasn't that. Just one of Jesse's sons, the youngest boy. Even though he was the king, he is the king and is the greatest warrior of Israel. David's accomplishments and his fame could never merit the promise that God had made to him. For the sake of your word and according to your will, not my will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. Oh, Lord, I thank you so much for being so good to me, Lord. Oh, who am I to deserve all of these blessings that you've laid down on us? Every kingdom citizen through faith should seek to discover what is God preparing him or her to do. Now, how is he shaping his or her life? So the question, I'm getting all hot and sweaty up here now. I ain't got all hook up in this, in this, in this thing. Ha, 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 how is he working with you? How is he shaping you? If you don't know yet, keep asking. Be diligent. Be trusting. Point number three, kingdom citizens must accept that God grows them through the ups and downs of their lives. You ain't going through something just to be going through something. God is growing you. Through your trials and tribulations, God is growing you. Through your setbacks, God is growing you. And he helps you know and learn and understand that you're not going through this for nothing. He's shaping and molding you and getting you ready for the great legacy that he has for you. Look, look, look. David was in that field. You know that lion and the bear, bear and the bear he fought and all those, other, all those kind of things. Uh, the responsibility of taking care of a group of animals. You know, being a protector, being a seeker of them that were lost in the field. You, you understand that? God was preparing him. Fight with Goliath was a preparatory battle. I come to you what? In the name of a most high God. You're going to know when I defeat you that there's a God in Israel. And that God empowers me and strengthens me and allows me to handle this particular situation. You, uh, you understand? It, it, it's David who humbles himself. Who knows that when he has a fall, he can say, create in me a pure heart. I have made a mess of myself, but do what? Please create a right spirit in me. Because God, I know you ain't through with me yet. And look at where he is right now. Who am I, Lord? Oh, what a powerful question. I'm just a humble servant. 
of an almighty God who understands the danger of being out of position in my relationship with him. Point number three. Kingdom citizens must accept that God grows them through the ups and downs of their lives. You understand what I say? Uh, ups and downs, you're growing. You're going and you're growing and guess what? You're knowing a little bit more than what you knew before. David could see something mighty magnificent when he boldly proclaims this in verse 22. How great you are, sovereign Lord. And then he says something that's even more powerful. There is none like you. Can't you embrace that as you embrace God in your life? This means that David can see clearly who God is, the greatness of God. He beholds and receives and accepts the greatness of God. Well, how do you do that? Let me give you a couple of ways that God is great and then I'm going, and then I'm going, I'm going to leave and that'll be the end of this, this last lesson in the series. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you seven ways God is great. You think about that. God is so great that it's incomprehensible to us to who God is. You can't figure God out. You can't do it. We are so finite, we cannot even begin to grasp how infinite our God is. All powerful. All knowing. How about all loving? For those things that are good and within his will. We can't wrap ourselves around God because we ain't got enough of us to do that. Better that we sit tight and let God wrap his loving arms around us. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful feeling? Kind of give you a little bit of a testimony when that kind of thing comes out. Number two, God is so great he rules over time. Man cannot stop the clock. You can't do that. Why? Because God controls time. It may not be your time or your season yet, but God will get you ready and he'll make sure that the time is right for you to go and to step into that destiny that he has for you while you're in the preparation room. Our God is so great that he rules over time. God has not said the benediction on our lives just because we're going through a hard time. Or just because, because we messed up. Or just because we need to have our lives rebuilt. God has not said the benediction yet. No, 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 it's not the end yet. He's getting us ready and getting us right. He controls time. If man controls time, man will shut you down. But God controls time. He is so great, he knows everything. He knows things about you and you don't know about yourself. And there's nothing God needs to learn, nothing he has yet to discover because he's made everything. When he guides us, he does so in perfect knowledge. We may walk by faith, but we follow God who already knows what's ahead. That's the good thing about a fight. When you get into a fight, guess what? You don't know how the outcome is, but if you serve a God, the right God, God knows what the outcome is going to be. And so because we can't see the outcome, all we can do is just trust and be trusting in him. And that's what David had to learn after he had that fall and when he got into the process of rebuilding his life. Can't keep no secrets from him. Mm -mm. No, you can't run Bathsheba. You can't, you, 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 can't, you can't conspire to get rid of you right and think God ain't going to know. God is great in wisdom. That's number six. Why? He's wise. He's an all-wise God. We often seek answers from many places, but only God has the wisdom we need. Look what Isaiah 55 says. My thoughts ain't, uh, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than what? Your ways. And my thoughts than what? Your thoughts. God is infinitely wise. Don't think you're smarter than God. Number five, 
God is great in faithfulness. And I hope you got all of these down now. Number one, I said God is great in, that he's incomprehensible. We don't understand it. We can't get it. He's, number two, he's great over time. He rules over time. Number three, God is so great he knows everything. Number four, God is great in wisdom. And number five, God is great in faithfulness. You ever heard that song, Great is Our Faithfulness? Oh, yeah. We know that God is faithful and yet don't always feel that faithfulness when our circumstances are hard. You can't give up a God, thank God, for God, you. Be faithful. God's character is constant even when our circumstances aren't. It's not that he chooses to be faithful. He can do anything he want to do, as you must know. But he is faithful. None of us go to bed waiting to see if the sun will rise the next morning to make plans. We all know that the sun will rise. And we'll feel confident in that. Why? Because we know that we serve a God who will stir us up in, when the morning comes. Number six, God is great in goodness. How great God is, how good God is. We say that thing all the time. God is good what? All the time. All the time what? God is good. Yep. He's good because he is the source of everything good. And the measure by which we can even know what good is. It's easy enough to say that God is good when his life is going well, but when we are about to go through some things, as David did, can you still say God is good? I want you to know that's how good our God is a good God. And number seven, God is great in power. He's an all-powerful God. And so because he is, guess what? We can say this. All things are possible with God. Think someone's too far from God? God can save and think you too far from God? God can do what? Save you. Think your mess is too tangled for God to un untangle or detangle? Wrong. You think you're in the ashes? God can bring you some beauty. You think things are hard? God can make it easy through his own ways and in his own, own, own methods. But we got to be faith-filled, prayer praying, Bible reading, practicing daily the principles of God. The almighty God, and David learned this and it comes out so much in this prayer. The almighty God does what? He, he, he's always there. And he grabs us in such a way that he, he can shape us and mold us and and, 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 and shake off doubt, shake off fear, and, and, and allow us to grow into understanding how important it is. And then you can, if you understand this, you can say like they, oh Lord, who am I? And I would be the beneficiary of such greatness and such goodness and such grace and of such what? Mercy. That's what I'm talking about. So God's covenant promise of an eternal throne to David was filled, fulfilled in him in Jesus Christ. Go back and read the Jesus, the Jesus of the Messianic line and you'll find David there. Through Jesus the eternal king. And because it was, we too can receive God's promises in this new covenant. We have a new covenant relationship with God. So what God is called, what, so what is God calling you? We ask this question the very first lesson in this series. You know, what do you think God has as a purpose in your life? Asking the same question in a different way at the end of the series. What is God calling you towards? And if you have not made that change yet, even if it seems kind of crazy, are you willing to make the change? God often calls us to make a change in our lives to spur spiritual growth and further his plan for mankind. Therefore, what we are saying is God and only God. My God and my Lord, my Savior, my God, empowers us to build and rebuild our personal lives. And so, 
from the beginning where David was called to the end when he went the way of the world and was prepared to die. His life was much like our own lives were. Heartaches and pains, good times and bad times, trials and tribulations. But God was there through it all. And guess what in your life? God will be with you too. So if you haven't built your life yet, keep building. If you have built your life and things have caught a sort of stumble along the way, turn to God to help rebuild. And study the life of this great servant, this man after God's own heart, this man called King David. And you will see that nothing is impossible for God in this post-pandemic era. To God be the glory for the many things that he has done. Let us pray. Our Father and our great God, we do thank you for this privilege to study in the life of your servant David over the last two months. Thank you, Lord, for how you have demonstrated through the lives of David, through the life of David, how you can work in our own lives, how we can work through things, and understanding that you are a God who does what he works through and empowers rebuilt lives. Let us forever give you the glory and give you the honor. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.